everybody. This is Madeline Para. I'm your executive director, and I am honored to get to host the call today. If you've never watched our pre-conference video that just finished, I encourage you to check it out from community. Um, I'm just always really jazzed every time I watch and see all the videos and all the things that are said on that. So I had to divert into that, but mostly I wanna start our meeting today by acknowledging that this call is happening on a weekend when lots of people are gathering with their families for Easter or for Passover. And I just wanna wish everybody across all faiths and traditions, good times with your family and uh, in whatever traditions that you celebrate and deep connections to the values that sustain you through those. We're carrying on the call today, even though it's on this particular weekend, because we trust that you'll use this resource at the time and in the way that's right for you and for your group. So I do expect that some groups have changed when they're meeting this week. And you know, that's totally fine, whether you're listening live or watching the recording. Our goal with the call here with this meeting is to provide a resource to you. Uh, and, and basically to make manifest for all of us that we're part of a national team. You know, we're tackling a problem that's just so much bigger than, than any one of us, you know? And so it's a reminder that none of us is tackling this problem by ourselves. So in the meeting, we get to hear from people outside the organization who are doing good work and also tackling climate change. And we get to celebrate what we got done each month. And we put attention on how the work in your communities and chapters moves us forward on our national goals. So welcome again, in whatever way you're able to participate in the meeting and in supporting the work of CCL. So I'm excited about our guest today. It's Kaisa Hendrickson, and she's a director at Future 500. Kaisa works to build bridges between people and groups that are at odds or even in conflict. Sounds a little bit like us. She's currently collaborating on several projects, one of which includes CCL coordinators, non-governmental organizations, and community representatives in the Southeast on a utility stakeholder information exchange. Before joining Future 500, Kaisa worked on stakeholder engagement with the largest solar incentive program in the country, closing the gap between who has access to and who benefits from sustainable energy. So welcome, Kaisa. Welcome. Good morning, Madeline. Delightful to be here and excited to talk to you. And I was so jazzed by that video. <laughs> yeah, isn't that something? So first of all, what is Future 500? <laughs> Tell us about that. It's taken me a while to figure it out. And, and what yes. do you do with it? Yeah. We get asked that question a lot. We are a very small boutique consulting group, but we're actually a nonprofit consulting group. And how that started is back in the 90s, our founder, uh, Bill Shireman, who's also known as Bottle Bill because he helped pass the Bottle Bill in California, was doing, ended up doing work between Rainforest Action Network and Mitsubishi Corporation around advocacy and campaigns that Rainforest Action Network was launching against Mitsubishi regarding deforestation in their supply chain. He managed to get both groups together, find the right people in the room who would be willing to have conversations, and essentially help them mediate over the course of several months a, an outcome and a new forestry, uh, forestry commitment uh, from Mitsubishi that was agreed on by both groups. And so from there, he saw the opportunity that, you know, instead of companies and advocates always being at, at odds with one another, that there's a lot more we can do if we can work together. Sound familiar? Uh, and so he started Future 500 as an organization who focuses on engaging with corporations, particularly large multinational corporations. So sometimes the ones that are have seen most negatively and helping them understand their advocates, uh, their activists, their stakeholders. So a lot of what's called stakeholder capitalism now and, and then helping those companies actually build bridges with their advocates and stakeholder groups, knowing that that can help prevent a lot of work. Sometimes we work with companies more reactively, but we generally try to work with companies proactively so that they can be talking to their stakeholders, uh, particularly because oftentimes we find out these groups don't speak the same language. So they think they both hate each other just on pure principle of wanting to destroy the planet and on just hating corporations and hating capitalism. Uh, so we do a lot of kind of bridge building there to, to help both groups kind of come together. And when we say stakeholders, we mean activists, investors, philanthropists, uh, it's kind of a broad range of people that can be stakeholders. 
And so when I do a future 500, because I come from a background of conflict resolution as well as environmental policy is I advise and work with all of our utilities. So I work with large utilities across the country to understand what their stakeholders are. So helping them, kind of coaching them internally on what are stakeholder issues? Why are they asking me about a just energy transition when I'm just focused on the energy transition? Uh, and helping them understand which stakeholders they can be talking to and building relationships with. So uh, I do a lot of kind of coaching. I get to bring in some of my justice and conflict resolution background and build relationships between people all the time. Oh, wow. That, that's very, very, very interesting. Uh, I want to mention if maybe you can lean in again a little bit more because we did get a little feedback that your audio is not quite as clear or, or just talk a little louder. That might help people. I'll work on some projections. Sorry about that. That's okay. I, th I was able to catch it. So I'm assuming that people were catching it. Just it, it'll be a little better. Good. I'll speak um, up. Yeah. So how did you get interested in that kind of work? Well, ironically, it was in my last position working for the Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing Program, or SOMA, which again was the largest solar incentive program when it came out. And that program was run by nonprofits in the state of California to create solar access. And the program itself was required a lot of stakeholder engagement. And that required getting buy-in from people across the state, from community groups, from local governments, from community-based organizations. And so I ended up taking over that part of the role and just fell in love with it because a lot of people had mistrust over the what an incentive program was for, why it would be helping them. So what I ended up doing was taking what I thought was something I could never get paid to do, which is building relationships, and took my knowledge of energy and then used that to build relationships across the program. And within six months, we had some really big partnerships. We had uh, a lot of collaboration between California's public utilities and the stakeholder groups across the state to help promote this program. And so when Future 500 opened up an opportunity, I was more than thrilled to come in, particularly because it's focused on bridge building, which is what CCL appeals to me for, because I grew up in Utah. I grew up in an area where there's not a whole lot of positive interactions between environmental groups and the government. And so I have grown up being in this intermediate area. So that really appeals to me about both what CCL does and what Future 500 does in terms of getting people to unite around what matters to them. Do you have any um, favorite stories of how you got people to understand each other? Because, uh, <laughs> you know, we're constantly trying to figure this out. <laughs> I can share a few of them actually. So the first one I'll share is actually one that happened before I joined Future 500, but is I think just a fantastic story that gets into not just successes, but also some of the learning lessons around doing this kind of work, which is that it takes time. Uh, so Future 500 in the past, one of our clients was a large oil and gas company. And sometimes our team said, it feels like we're getting nowhere. We try to connect them to stakeholders. We've built some relationships, but we're just not seeing any changes. And then uh, probably about a few years into the relationship, we got a call from a, a C-suite person at this oil and gas company saying, I just got a call from someone from a large environmental NGO group saying they were about to launch a campaign against us on a particular topic. We were able to resolve the whole thing before the campaign launched because we didn't know it was an issue. It wasn't something we prioritized, but because you helped us build that relationship with this NGO, they felt comfortable reaching out to us in advance saying, hey, we're really unhappy with something you're doing. We want to get you to change your behavior. And they said, okay, great, we'll change our behavior. So that's something again, that took years. It took time and took a lot of relationship building, but that large oil company and that large NGO were able to prevent something and change the company's behavior, which is the best that we can ask for. So that's one that I'll share. So Another you, one. I oh, just yeah. have to, that's fascinating because you, it bore fruit in unexpected ways later. And, yeah. and that's part of the power uh, of what you're doing there, but you can't predict it. You definitely can't predict it. And we even found out 
later from, from the same company that they said working with us helped shift their culture, which is mind blowing to get to here, but is also so valuable. And the person who, who shared that feedback, who I've since spoken to, said, you know, it took time. A lot of people in our company didn't see any value in engaging our stakeholders. They thought they're just there to be an annoying fly in our ear to just pester us. Why bother? Uh, and in taking time to work with us and to see the outcomes that can happen from building relationships, from being open to having conversations with stakeholders, that these uh, uh, the, the whole company was able to kind of shift their perspective on the importance of stakeholders. So they got ahead on the stakeholder capitalism front. So uh, one of the, the other really great examples that is one that I'm actually working on now is with a large utility. And they, even in just some of the smallest ways, so this is going to sound maybe not like the most exciting thing to have gotten through, um, but there were some large issues coming up around environmental justice. And they approached us and said, you know, why does this one particular concern matter? I got to pull into my master's degree, use some of the information I've done in the past, and really explain to them where this group was coming from, why environmental justice was a bigger issue in this area, and actually got to refocus part of our entire um, meeting series with them based on this feedback and helping the company understand why this mattered and why ignoring it would be an even worse decision. Uh, so it, it was a, a really cool, successful moment, even if it was small, but again, that goes towards company-wide culture and change. I love these stories and, and it brings my mind into like the nitty gritty, uh, like, uh, so uh, on a, on a like day-to-day -day thing, it, you know, like in one case, I'm sort of imagining like maybe people are sitting in a circle talking to each other and you're facilitating it. And in another case, it's like they're on the phone talking to you or something like, like what, what is the like, the, the real, like the nitty gritty of like, how do you do this? <laughs> I'll start with a few different examples uh, or, or kind of pathways that this works. The first and most common one is companies come to us and they say, so-and-so's mad at us. Why are they mad? And so we sit down and have a conversation and A, explain, because we're, we're kind of an expert generalist team. Um, so one of my colleagues is really a specialist more on the plastic side and more specialist on the energy side. Um, and we sit and we are all specialists in knowing who are the activist investors in here? What are activist investors talking about? Who are the NGO advocates? Who are the community-based organizations? And so in that instance, say uh, the, the company comes to us, we sit down and, and talk about, okay, which groups are you talking to? Who are you engaging with? Are you actually engaging with them or are you ignoring them? Are you just relying on PR, which is also not relationship building. That is very different. And, and so we, so a lot of it is just kind of that coaching conversations with the clients and that takes months. That takes, and, and in oftentimes instances that can take years depending on the organization, because sometimes we're working with someone who is um, what I like to call an entrepreneur, someone who's trying to make change from within the organization, but who may not have leadership support for engaging with stakeholders. And um, other times we are working with chief sustainability officers or chief operations officers. Um, and in those instances, it's kind of more direct where they have immediate influence to get change in the company or get buy-in and willingness to engage with stakeholders. And, and so I'll, I'll use the example of a large, very large utility out of the Southeast that we've been working with now for 12 years. And they came to us 12 years ago and said, we're having just sh like shareholder resolution after shareholder resolution. Um, our activists are coming after us. It's just terrible. And so our, our team sat down with their CEO and developed an annual forum between where they invited, uh, they selected a, a group of investor or activist investors, community-based organizations, NGOs um, to come into a room and meet with the CEO and a few of the team members and give them direct feedback on what they wanted to see the company do differently, how the company was harming particular groups, how their actions were, were causing pollution or harming the environment. And the outcome from that was within a few years, their shareholder resolutions completely dipped. The company is still doing it now 12 years later. And we still have a relationship with the CEO who very 
vociferously advocates to other CEOs about the importance of having these relationships and conversations. And the best part is, as he says, they're going to say things you don't like. They're going to say things that are going to hurt or going to make you feel bad about your company. But that's where the dialogue starts. And over the course of the years we've been working with them, we've had to do a lot of coaching with their team on how do you accept feedback that's not going to feel good? How do you still be, how do you remove the personal from the situation? How do you still engage positively? And how do you keep those relationships going on? How do you build accountability? So that's one of our, our best success stories of kind of the nitty gritty. So it involved a lot of coaching, a lot of mentoring, and then we actually facilitated and mediated all of their meetings and continue to as a, a third party. Um, so my day involves a bit of mediating, a bit of on that phone kind of coaching call, a bit of talking to stakeholders to get feedback on their perspective. We don't just rely on the company's perspective. Again, I find this fascinating. So um, here you're talking about a situation, I think, where activists um, did what activists do uh, mm -hmm. using a variety of techniques. And, and it eventually, I'm, I'm putting this out to see if I've got it, it motivated the company. But, but, but mm -hmm. often that's out of the public eye. Yes. That's one of the things that's interesting here, like your role is, is mostly out of the public eye, but the activists were a necessary part of this to motivate the company, but maybe without a go between it's hard to make progress. More than anything, that is what we we hear is, is that the activists are like, I don't, I don't know how to break in. They won't listen to us. They won't come to, to the table. And how do we know that there's good faith? And that comes from, we hear that from both the companies and the stakeholders that why would I trust them? They're just going to immediately go out to the, to the media and publish something about us or the stakeholders think this is just to find ways to exploit the situation. And so part of that is we, we host every gathering, every interaction we have under Chatham House rules where people are allowed to take what they hear from this but not attribute it to somebody. And that's one of multiple tools that we use in terms of trust building and establishing communication boundaries, things that I imagine CCL uses just in teaching people how to talk to senators and how to talk to aides um, that may be, really disagree with you. Uh, we use those same tools to, once activists and advocates have, have started launching their cam campaign to say, okay, here's now here's a venue to get you in the same room. We need you to come in in good faith and participate, just like the company's coming in in good faith to participate. Yeah. Okay. So you haven't mentioned yet that you were a CCL volunteer, <laughs> um, but, but you're well positioned then for this next question, which is how, how can we in CCL take what you understand and have learned and used into our work building bridges or, or, you know, whether that's our outreach to companies or to other stakeholders or members of Congress, so yeah. Favorite question so far, um, all wonderful. So I would say, a, a yes, I was a CCLer in 2019 for a short period of time, especially for the pandemic hit, but um, I, I really loved the work and was really drawn into what CCL does and got to learn from uh, Carl, who's here on the chat and, and a few other fantastic folks in San Diego who were very much in a, divisive environment of some of our politicians were very for this, some were very against anything environmental. Um, and so I am, I am so grateful for what I learned and what I've gotten to take then into the work that I do now. And so what I'd say from the work that I do now for, for CCLers is, A, there's a lot of overlap in, in what we do, where fundamentally what you're doing is you're humanizing people to one another. You're humanizing yourself. You're humanizing the stories that you're telling. And if you're meeting with Congress people, if you're meeting with companies, that person is a person. And so first and foremost, treating them like a person and building that personal connection is the most important thing. I can be talking to someone from a company that I vehemently disagree with, but I know that's their life and their livelihood, that they are doing the best, that they are, are in their situation. Likewise, when I'm talking to an activist or an advocate and that humanizing is how we can get past all of our differences. And it, you can't even get to a point of 
having a conversation if you can't see each other as people. So just like in, in working with your Congress people and representatives, they are people too. It may be hard sometimes to feel like that, but they are people too, regardless of their political affiliation. So I'd say that, that humanizing is one component. A second component is the patience and the, like, the long-term thinking and knowing, which can be so hard when environmental work feels like everything is on fire. What do you do when everything is on fire? Uh, but so much of these relationships and these cultural changes are what we call social acupressure or acupuncture, where you're putting pressure points at different spaces and stages. So you're the work that we do, I see going hand in hand with the work that CCL does, that you are putting pressure in different areas. We are putting pressure in different areas. And so much of the time, this is where my conflict resolution background comes in. People stop listening when they get yelled at. We all shut down if we're being blamed. So I love the CCL approach of kindness, of gratitude, of thanks to who you are working with and appreciation and using that as a, again, a way to, to humanize, to build trust. And uh, that's a, a really hard thing to do, but it's so important. And I'd say some of the other things that I would learn are find things to stay excited about. Find, find those little wins, no matter how small they are. They are never too small, um, particularly because this is a long-term battle, no matter how hard um, and how urgent the work is. You still have to keep yourself going and motivated um, and to find joy with people. You, it's amazing how much laughter can break everything down. So if, again, that humanizing, that relationship building, finding some joy and finding some humor in what you're doing or with other people um, is one of my, my favorite takeaways. Mm, thank you. We've got some questions in the Q&A now. So let's uh, see what Flannery's got for us, got for you. All right. So we have um, our top or one of our top upvoted questions uh, is asking, pointing out that the fossil fuel industry has such a history of dishonesty. Um, how do you uh, verify or can you verify that they're not just using the tools of conflict resolution to further manipulate or delay action uh, or just continue to expand extraction? And that we have a couple other questions where folks are asking, has a fossil fuel company ever um, committed to, uh, to changes that would, um, that would move away from fossil fuels or would, you know, uh, work to meet the IPCC goals, things like that? A fantastic question. And I will say just like trying to reach across the political boundaries, it's a really hard area to work in. Um, these are companies where this is their business model. This is what keeps them going. And in terms of the uh, kind of the good faith component, we do vet the background of the companies that we work with. We do have certain commitments that they have to reach. We also have a transparency requirement. So every company we work with is on our website. And uh, we, so in, uh, that's the, the kind of the, the transparency side. We have not had a company commit to moving away from, from fossil fuels. I think that is similarly an, an issue that everyone has to kind of keep. That's a social acupressure point to, to keep moving companies away. What we describe ourselves as is a critical friend, that we are here, we're there to answer questions, and we're also going to give them feedback they don't like. So does that mean that they always take action on what we say? No, but it also means that we get to give them hard feedback saying, you know, this next choice you're going to make is going to further harm trust, or nobody trusts you to begin with right now. Here's some steps you can do towards building trust. And I will say we've, we've had commitments from companies on smaller things. Again, not changing their entire business model. That would be amazing. I would, but who knows? Uh, but we have had smaller commitments to change how they work in an area, to um, engage with groups that are actively trying to change their business model. So um, not a full answer to that. It, again, it's a, it's a challenging area. It's a huge, massive industry. And we're just one of those pressure points. So those pressure points are also being pushed by public, by consumers, by policy, as well as what we're what we're doing. 
and and by activists, as you mentioned. So we have um, one question, just clarifying your the the use of the term. So they say activist yeah. investor means one thing on Wall Street, which we think is different than the way you're using it. So could you sort of clarify what you mean when you talk about activists? And then also the uh, sort of a follow up question: um, Can you weigh in on uh, if there are certain activist investor groups that are uh, effective at at uh, creating change? Great point and, and clarification. So we we actually use a spectrum with companies that we explain to them where different groups kind of fall in terms of their willingness to engage. And even with activists, just traditional activist NGOs whose goal is changing company behavior through public campaigns. So big ones like NRDC, smaller ones like, I think it's Climate Action 350 uh, or 360. Uh, those ones we we talk to companies about kind of the impact that each one of those groups are for and that there are some that will not work with them and that's the point that those groups are there to push the narrative to a certain direction and that, to help lead companies there and then there are activists that are in the middle who will talk to companies um, so that's when we're talking about the activist side when we're talking about activist investors we are traditionally talking about investors who will buy a share in a company and will use their votes to get the company to make different changes who will file proxies with the company asking for change. And so one of the biggest ones that most people are familiar with is one like As You Sow, who two or three years now ago got three board seats on Exxon's board overthrown essentially, which was historic. And that, it's a little too soon for us to see just how much of an impact that is going to have, but that has never happened in the past. And that is a level of power that I think it is hard to understate. Um, so I, I do think, again, to the social acupuncture or acupressure point of view, activist investors have a very important role in terms of pressuring a company through the channels of power that companies already work in, as opposed to traditional activists and NGOs, which are kind of forced to be a voice externally outside of the systems of power and fight harder to get their voices heard because they are part of the system. Um, so that's how we, when we're talking about activist investors, that's what we're, we're talking about. So the Interfaith uh, um, uh, Council on Corporate Responsibility, as you so, engine number one, are what we talk about with activist investors. It would seem to me that this validates this idea of a, an ecosystem of, of uh, within the climate movement or the, the environmental movement, so that different groups doing different tactics help to, that, that, that at least sometimes there's a synergy there that can help to move things forward rather than one thing all, you know, only doing one tactic by everybody. And that they're all really equally important. So there's not one, we, and we don't tell companies that like, oh, this one's the one that matters, or these are the ones to pay attention to. They, they all have such an important role in the pressure. Um, so for example, this utility that I'm working with, I'm working with a coordinator from CCL as well on this. And this is a series of stakeholder engagements with this utility. And we have voices coming from local government, from local power companies, from CCL, from Sierra Club, from other NGOs. And each one of these groups brings such a different perspective and different voice. And our job is kind of to elevate each one of those voices, help the company be ready to hear those. Um, and each one hits a different pressure point and, and a different, it brings a different validity to what they're trying to get the company to do. Thank you. We're just about out of time. Is there one sort of concluding question you would pull out, Flannery? We could do one short one. Um, someone was wondering, how long does the mediation process uh, take or what's the longest you've ever spent on a successful mediation? <laughs> Years or for the longest. The shortest, I would say no less than a year to 18 months because we're talking culture change, we're talking interpersonal change. And half the time we're also kind of getting companies to look at how they handle their own internal stakeholders. That's a part I didn't mention is like their employees, their, their board, those are stakeholders too. Um, so we, we also do a lot of work with companies, even just trying to get their teams on board or how to change the language around uh, how they see environmental things or environmental groups. So I'd say, as much as I hate to say it, it depends, uh, but a long time, unfortunately, <clears throat> this is the, the one I'm doing out of the Southeast, that has been an eight month process. And I'd say we're still very much in the trust building stage. Good thing we're all in it for the long haul. <laughs> exactly. And again, that every single person, every single CCCLer I've met, CCLer I've met is so important and impactful and makes 
a difference in every conversation you have. So never feel like you are unimportant because every conversation you have matters, even if it's not with a legislator. Thank you so much, Kaisa, for being here, for taking time on Saturday, and for all the years of work that you're investing in. <laughs> Thank you, PCL, and everyone who's on this call. You all do incredible, wonderful work, and I believe in what you do, and I'm so grateful for you all. All right. You are welcome to stay on for the last 10 minutes of our call, where we go over what's been happening and what we think should be happening, but I understand that it's a Saturday, so... <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much, Madeline. Yeah, thanks. Well, so yeah, folks, March was a busy month, you know, but you're always busy being climate advocates. That's how we are. Oh, I want to highlight a few things. The return to regional conferences was in full force, and this made me so happy that uh, any way we can come together, whether it's virtual or in person, but especially in person to have that coming back. So we had in-person conferences in the Mid-Atlantic, California, Southeast and Northeast regions. And we had virtual conferences in the Tornadoes and Pacific Northwest regions. Texas jumped in with a state conference and a state lobby day as well. And I hear other states also have been lobbying their state legislatures. And I just wanna say how incredibly grateful I am to the people who did the work of putting those conferences and events together. Um, it's again, so valuable to give people that way to connect and take our advocacy to new levels. So thank you conference organizers. We also had our third conservative climate leadership conference in Washington DC last month, over 80 people attended and this marked our return to in-person lobbying on the Hill. The uh, Rita Center CCLers had 24 meetings with Republican members of Congress. And in several cases, those meetings went on for over an hour. And in one case that included a member of Congress who came out and stood there with them for an hour. That's how well received our conservatives were. And as always, you know, as you're at ahead of lobby day, you could see these little groups of people meeting in the hallways at every break at meals, planning their meetings all through the conference venue. And that always just brings such joy to my heart seeing that. And, um, you know, they embody our integrity value of being prepared. Um, I, I just, I love the way y'all are. March also included our spring fundraising campaign. And thanks to your support and generosity, we reached our goal of 10,000 in new monthly donors. That steady stream is very, very helpful. And that also unlocked a $100,000 matching gift, which we love receiving. So again, thank you for all the support of the March appeal and uh, you know, by spreading the word and by doing what you could do personally. You know, you might have heard the news last week that like many businesses and nonprofits, CCL has found this to be a challenging economy and a challenging time. And the support of our membership provides the foundation. So we are so grateful for the way you hold steady in good and bad economies. And I have to mention that the staff was incredibly touched by the way extra donations poured in after the group leader meeting on Tuesday when I let our group leaders know that we had to make some cuts in staffing. CCL is gonna remain strong um, because of that mutual support that flows through all parts of our organization from the volunteers, through the staff and through our boards. So thank you again, everybody. March was also a month when many of you connected with your members of Congress in the district. I love how you rose to the challenge uh, that we gave of finding new ways to build a relationship with your member of Congress and their staff. And here's my uh, latest favorite example. So you can see there's a picture here um, from our Chester County, Pennsylvania Citizens Climate Lobby Group. They planted a tree in honor of their representative, uh, Representative Chrissy Houlihan, who's there with the shovel. So she came, she helped with the planting, and there was a news story. So congratulations to all of you, and what a wonderful way to build a relationship. All right. April's going to be busy, too, of course. Um, you're already out there with Earth Day-related activities. It's always a big month for us. And so, you know, remember how we're a national team, and all our individual and group uh, actions add up to big things? Well, that's why we have a new challenge for you. 500 outreach events in April. That's our national goal. 
We are already at 67 logged, and this includes tabling, presenting, film screening, grass tops, and editorial board events. So keep putting those in the action tracker as they happen. Uh, and I'm confident we're gonna blow past that goal because it's April and it's Earth Day coming. So you'll be able to see the national progress on the home dashboard of our member website, CCL Community. Here are the recommended April actions and they are almost entirely related to Earth Day. So I'm gonna read them and then we'll dive into one of them a little bit more with some slides. So uh, one is include a peanuts climate activity counseling booth, peanuts as in Charlie Brown uh, or Lucy who used to have that counseling booth at your Earth Day table. Two, onboard new folks you recruit during your Earth Day activities. I'm sure you'd be doing that anyway. Three, our social media bonus action is to record and post a short video of an Earth Day event. Fourth, the chapter development bonus action is to pass the hat to send someone to the June conference. And then the communications action uh, exercise is to practice talking to a table visitor. So let's go back to the first one. I asked Brett to, to show you um, what this climate anxiety counseling booth looks like. So Brett. Thanks, Madeline. Yeah, I guess my first question for everyone is what do April showers bring? Well, uh, if you're here in Duluth, a historic, long, heavy winter due to global warming. But for the rest of the country, we have Earth Day outreach events that we're going to preview today, everyone. And I know that, like Madeline's already highlighted, we have already gotten almost 70 of them throughout the country. What I'd like to highlight, we just put a link in the chat, is where you can find and what is available for this Earth Month in your outreach, thanks to our amazing marketing team. We're going to talk through the counseling booth the Climate Guilt-Free Pass, as well as a fun new flyer by the Climate of Coffee. So the first reminder is all of our resources are available on CCL Community. If you just click on this little resources and training drop-down menu, and then from there, all resources, you should see here that main view. They're right here at the very top, but they're also available in our tabling materials section. You can also search and type in any of these keywords if you're looking as well. So what are we actually talking about here? Well, the great creative idea behind this theme is shared with that peanuts comment that Lucy behind the booth is going to be able to provide help. Right now, all of us are in a position where we can listen to and engage our communities on their concerns about climate change and then provide them the opportunity to take action, which we know is the antidote to despair. So let's do that this year in a really creative and fun engaging way by putting together your own climate anxiety counseling booth or using the one that we've created and have available for download and order on that resource page that we just put in the chat. You're more than welcome to set it up like this. If you don't have the full budget for a foam board, we have an eight and a half by 11 inch sign you can print out too. And again, engage in conversations where you listen and help others express their concern for being engaged on climate change, and then also finding out how they can take action. And how they can take action, we have a couple of great options, one of which is this wonderful climate guilt-free pass. You can see here on the left-hand side, climate guilt gets us all. So we're giving you one climate guilt-free pass. They're able to immediately scan and redeem that pass by taking action and contacting their member of Congress to ask them to protect America's forests which is our main ask and engagement for Earth Month. You're also welcome to use any of our other handouts for that same opportunity. And then in addition, we have this wonderful handout where you can engage people to crowdfund for CCL if they're interested with this fun creative approach where they're able to scan with their app to access PayPal and then immediately there kind of feel part of the movement by being able to look out for the climate by donating and supporting CCL. The last thing I'll just highlight here is we have already gotten some great photos of these booths in action. And so if you are interested in having marketing share what you have been up to so that we can communicate across all of our social media channels and on our future trainings and outreach, please just email marketing at citizensclimate.org or go to this short link and upload your own photos. That's cclusa.org forward slash chapter photos drive. And you too can engage in these discussions and have a chance to really help your community take action together and feel like their concerns are being addressed. 
So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Madeline, and we can't wait to hear and see all of the inspirational photos and outreach events each of you are doing. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. You know, that amazing display of creativity embodies the amazing synergy between CCL volunteers and staff. The idea for that climate counseling booth came from one of you or several of you. Uh, it got, you know, shared and passed along and staff could tell you were excited about it and then staff developed it further into something that everyone could use. Um, you know, I, I just think with teamwork like that happening across the country between our members and our staff, we are going to build the political will it takes to ensure a livable planet. So thank you for the creativity you have out in the field. Thank you to our marketing and program staff who put that uh, out to everybody. I wanna end the call with another part of our stellar teamwork, which would be, which is the synergy um, between the power of constituents, that's you, combined with the know-how of a skilled government affairs team, that's our Ben and Jen on who are our Hill staff, and they took a few minutes last week in front of the iconic Washington DC cherry blossoms to tell you why Congress is eager to see you again this June. So we're gonna share that video and wrap it up. Hey CCLers, I'm Ben Pendergrass, your Vice President of Government Affairs. And I'm Jen Tyler, your Senior Director of Government Affairs. As you can see from the trees around us, spring is coming a little bit early here to DC and that's getting us really excited for the upcoming June conference. You know, last year we had some of the most significant climate winds in history but we're not done yet. We need to get back to DC in June to make sure Congress knows that climate's still a priority, even with all the other things going on in the world right now. Not only are we gonna be talking about and lobbying on some really important topics, but just being there in numbers sends a strong message to Congress. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with staffers who have been so impressed by how many people we bring to the Hill every June. Every single chair in the Longworth cafeteria seems to be taken by a CCLer. And that really sends a key message to members of Congress that we're there, we're united, and we're gonna push them to advance priorities on climate. And you know, there's gonna be a lot of important things happening this year. We know we have to engage in Congress on permitting reform, make it where we can build clean energy infrastructure faster. We know the Farm Bill is coming and we need to preserve our climate wins from the IRA and the Farm Bill. And you know, we need to keep pushing Congress on a carbon price and CBAM legislation as well. And that's why you need to make it here in June. Really hope to see you guys in June. I can't wait to see you in June too, for all of you who are able to make it. And I look forward to wherever I cross paths with you and hear from you. Have a great month. April's always wonderful. Take good care and see you in June. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.